Good morning. What a beautiful day it is. So glad to be with you here today and uh, just uh, enjoying the weather. Um, before I get into the message today, I just want to let you know uh, what a beautiful time I had back in uh, Dallas last week. So I'd ask you to pray about this and what God was doing. Uh, it was our first service together, and uh, there was just a beautiful spirit of God upon everything that happened uh, while I was there. Uh, it was just uh, so exciting to get there Friday night to spend some time together with the group. And then uh, for their first service, it went off flawlessly. Everybody worked like a team. It was just like... It was just amazing, and uh, it was the first time that the people who led worship had done that, and God just blessed them both so much, inspired them. The worship was fantastic, but overall, just the spirit of God that was present in the meeting, it was just, he just kept confirming, and the thing that happened Friday night to me was he just let me see how much he loves them and how much he wanted me to be there for them, and it's, uh, it's amazing how that has carried on uh, in me just every day this week, and just, you know, thinking through how much God loves his people wherever they are, and wherever there's a willing heart to come to him, uh, he desires for that to be nurtured, and you know, we all have that opportunity in our lives, and should continually be praying for the people around us, for our loved ones, for our family members who don't know Christ, that they would come to know him, and that should be our passion, that people would come to know Jesus Christ and whatever way God can use us to be available to them, to encourage that relationship, that we would do that. And that is really the beauty when we can strip away the things that cloud our heart, as, as Mark was saying in the prayer, things of rejection, things of depression, things that just muddy up our thinking and make it more complex than it needs to be when there is a simplicity that's in Jesus Christ and our pursuit of him. So it was just a really beautiful time. And I would just ask for us, church, to continue to pray for the group that we would have a consistent place to meet uh, in Dallas. So the, the place where we met was beautiful. It was great for a first service. Uh, we had 44 people there for the first uh, service. So that was really cool. And um, But I think that just overall... Um, it's, it's not a place that right now they can meet every week. So like even next week, there's no place to meet on that day because the, the library where they're meeting is closed. So great room to meet. Uh, it was really neat uh, to see it. And, uh, but ultimately, uh, just prayers for that. And, and plus, like they had to bring in a whole sound system and take it out. And again, just to watch a team of people work together, uh, it was really incredible. So very exciting stuff. So... Um, Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, you know what, let's just pray right now for them. I don't want to go ahead of this, so uh, just join me in praying for a place. Father, I just thank you so much for uh, this group of people that you're springing up uh, that we can be of help to in Dallas, and I just pray that you would help us to understand how to, but certainly we can lift up their need to you, which is a place to meet every week. They desire that and to have a place to offer and invite people to come where there can be the worship of you, and I just ask that you would please give them a place to meet, that you would give them the direction, uh, that you would provide the finances for it, and all things, God, that you would prepare hearts in the group to receive people unto you, that God, in whatever way they can be a source of comfort, love, encouragement, exhortation, teaching, fellowship, that we may help others who are searching for you come to you to know your son, Jesus Christ. We just ask for this help and look to you, trusting in you, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, so sometimes in life, you, you, you get the elephant in the room, right? It's the subject that everybody kind of knows about, but nobody talks about. And uh, we're going to kind of address an elephant in the room today. And it's not that we uh, don't talk about it, it's just that we don't talk about that it that often, and there's reasons for that that I want to express. But we are a Christian church. Amen. Why don't we celebrate Christmas? Not Let's not get ahead of ourselves right now. All right? I think it's a good question to ask because, look, is we look around the Christian world, the Christian world right now is preparing to celebrate Christmas. And, but also the secular world is preparing to celebrate Christmas without it. But what is the reason that Christ's name is on this holiday, the Mass of Christ or Christ Mass? And why don't we teach that here? 
Why won't you find an encouragement to keep that here? So I want to go through some uh, slides today and, and give some answers on this and talk about why this is when it's the biggest Christian holiday by, in terms of attendance and participation throughout the year. Why don't we do this? So let's start by taking a little holiday quiz here. Dusty, you may not answer this question. <laughs> How many verses are there in the Bible? Does anybody know the answer to that? How many verses are in the Bible? All right. So the reason Dusty can't say this is because we had it in school of ministry, and he used it in one of his speeches recently. There's a lot. There's 31,102 verses in the Bible. So that's a lot of verses. How many verses are in the Old Testament? 23,145. How about in the New Testament? Anybody have a guess on that? Who's quick with their math? I just gave you the answer. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing a lot of murmuring. It's somewhere in there. Yeah, it's, it's almost 8,000, 7,957 verses in the New Testament. Okay, so here's the first question when it comes to this topic of Christmas. Why did I have you take this holiday quiz? How many verses are dedicated to the celebration of Christmas in the Old Testament? Very good. So the answer is zero. Now, if you're going to teach a topic in a Christian organization that says we believe in the Bible and want to express it, there should be proof somewhere that God breathed to us about it. So how many verses are dedicated to the celebration of God's feast in the Old Testament? 472. It's about 2% of all verses in the Old Testament talk about holidays that came from God's mind. None of those are talking about Christmas. Now, I'm bringing this as a way of just understanding of, of how the impact is because there's one thing that I want to encourage us, and more than this topic today, I hope we see, and that is simply to question, why do we do what we do, and from where do our beliefs derive? Where do they come from? How are we coming to do what we do? So, how many verses are dedicated to the celebration of Christmas in the New Testament? Yes, that's correct. Zero. You won't find it in any place in the scriptures about this day. Yet, it's the number one day celebrated in Christianity as a holiday. Do you find that a bit interesting? I find it fascinating. Because somewhere then outside of the Bible, this had to come into to practice. Now, conversely, how many verses are dedicated to the celebration of God's feast? So whether it's the Sabbath, Passover, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, 202. Talk about the celebration or keeping of God's feast in the New Testament. So... All told, there's about 674 verses we could turn to for, that talk about the feast or how to keep the feast in the Bible. Now, that's a pretty decent number, but you might be saying, well, of 31,000 verses, you would say, well, maybe that's not that big. It's a little over 2%, right? But I want you to look at this list. These are, this is a list of how many times these words that we would commonly refer to in Christianity appear in verses in the Bible. So if you're looking up the word spirit, for instance, in the Bible, in all the Bible, 456 times you're going to find that word, spirit. Kindness, 87 times. Salvation, saved and save and saves, 419 times. So when we talk about the feast days having a dedication of time of about 2% of the verses in the Bible speak to them, it does have some weight in it. And the thing is, how much do we pay attention to what God breathed in this regard in as much as we might pay attention to things like singing 102 times, praising 266 times when you have these verses? So my point to us today in, in looking at these numbers is just to say, do we realize the significance of it? Because what I'm going to put forth to you is this, that society and how we societally as Christians practice our Christianity, greatly influences the way we look at the Word of God. 
And what we do is we give weight to things that aren't there, and we also don't give weight to things that actually are there. And why do we do that? Because we all have bias. We all have been taught certain things and comes in. But one of the interesting things is that when God revealed to me about uh, his feast days back as a teenager, the number one thing like the pastor at my church would say is, hey, David, those are done away. You don't have to do that anymore. Okay. So the things that I can read about were set aside, but then things I can't read about were instituted. So that how was I being a Christian if I wasn't keeping Christmas or Easter? Now, I believe in celebrating Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. I love that Jesus Christ came into the world. It is a time of great praising and joy to remember that Jesus Christ came into the flesh, in the flesh to this world. It's a time of great celebration that we celebrate and that we celebrate his resurrection from the dead. So it's not a matter of the things that are in the Bible that might be spoken about his birth or his death or his resurrection. We want to remember and commemorate as, as the Bible teaches us to. But where do these things come from? So if we only listen to God's voice in what we do for our biblical practices, what holidays then would we be keeping? It seems like it would have to be the ones that we could read about in the scriptures and the ones that we could talk about that God had said to do, right? If you only had been given the Bible and you lived on an island, you knew nothing about God or society, and God just said, here it is. Read the letter. I wrote 31,102 verses. And you read it. You would have no knowledge of celebrating Christmas in a Christian community but you would have knowledge that Christians celebrated God's feast. The holy days are the holidays he created because you would see the evidence of that. Sometimes people would even talk about the Apostle Paul and that he did away with the celebrations of God's feasts. But what's so interesting is that it's recorded like in the book of Acts. He actually told the Ephesians, he said, I'm not going to stay and keep teaching to you. I want to go keep the feast in, in Jerusalem, so I'm heading back there. He literally stopped teaching people in Ephesus to go keep the feast. Now, later, he's back on another tour, and he's in Asia and going to Gentile cities, and there it's recorded in Acts 20 that he, he was keeping the days of unleavened bread in those Gentile places. So it wasn't that he saw that he had to go back to uh, Jerusalem for every feast, but he was there with the Gentiles keeping the feasts. And then what do we see? that he again bypasses Ephesus because he's like, I want to get back for Pentecost. So the Apostle Paul didn't have this exit his life when he came to Jesus, but rather something really neat happened, and that is this. The first Christians, as it says here in the Encyclopedia Britannica, continued to observe the Jewish festivals, though in a new spirit as commemorations of events which those festivals had foreshadowed. So now what we're going to do, because there is no Bible on this part of the message that I want to talk about, I'm going to use 19 different sources. Remember how when you were a kid and you had to write papers and your teacher would say, you need, to, you need to have at least three sources or five sources or seven? I'm going to show you 19 today because they all pretty much agree with each other. In fact, I can't find any dissenting things in terms of what Christmas is really about. But Christians continued to observe uh, the, the festivals that you read about in the Bible. That's recorded in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So since there is no instruction for it, is Christmas really a Christian holiday? And if it's not a biblical holiday, how did it become Christian? What are its origins? So this is what I'm going to give you answers on today. So since there is no biblical evidence is there any non-biblical evidence that Christmas was celebrated by Jesus? As far as we know, no. There's no evidence of that at all. What about by his disciples? No, you can search the Bible. You, you're not going to find that it's there by their disciples. So now we're starting to get past the biblical age and going through the times uh, with their disciples. Nope. How about anywhere in the first century? So Jesus died somewhere around 80, 30. For the next 70 years, like through the whole time of the temple and the destruction in 70 AD, after that, is there any evidence that Christians were celebrating Christmas? 
The answer is no. There's no evidence of that to be found anywhere in historical documents and writing. All right, so here's another question. How about in the second century? No. You cannot find any recorded proof. So I want you to think about the timelines here because sometimes we look at time and it's, you know, in our own lives, days, years might take a while, but we look at like centuries like they're nothing when we look back in history. But Jesus and his disciples never celebrated Christmas. Their disciples never celebrated Christmas. Their disciples never celebrated Christmas. Their disciples. We go on through generations. There is zero evidence of any, uh, in any record of this ever happening. So where did it come from? How did it begin? Where did it really start? So here, reading from the Catholic Encyclopedia, it says, Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. Irenaeus and Tertullian omit it from their list of feasts. So those two lived in the third century. So even when they were talking about what feasts were celebrated in the Catholic Church at the time, you won't find it anywhere present in their writings. The early Christians, according to Encyclopedia.com, were not initially concerned with the nativity of Christ, and even in the fourth century, it was not a universally fixed observance among Christians. So now you're talking about a period of time longer than the history of the United States of America. Okay, so does that give you some perspective? Like for our whole history, basically they're saying since the time of Christ, this wasn't ever done. So again, good question to ask then, where is this coming from? How does it become a part of Christian observance? So, how did this happen? So, the largest pagan religious cult, which fostered the celebration of December 25th as a holiday throughout the Roman and Greek worlds, was the pagan sun worship, Mithraism. So, the, it says here, according to the Golden Bowl, the winter festival was called the Nativity of the Sun. The well-known uh, solar feast of uh, Natalis Invicti, which is the nativity of the unconquered sun, celebrated on 25 December, has a strong claim on the responsibility for our December date. That's according to the Catholic Encyclopedia. So even in understanding where it comes from, the Catholics who are probably the best at recording uh, Christian history uh, talk about what it is and why is that. So it says here, according to the Legacy of Rome, by Cyril Bailey, it is common knowledge that much of our association with the Christmas season, the holidays, the giving of presents, and the general feeling of geniality is but the inheritance of the Roman winter festival of Saturnalia. Again, continuing on here, it says, Christmas came to be celebrated on the Roman holiday of Saturnalia, and it was from the pagan holiday that many of the customs of Christmas had their roots. The celebrations of Saturnalia included the making and giving of small presents, this holiday was observed over a series of days beginning on December 17th, which is the birth of Saturn, and ending on December 25th, the birth of Sol Invictus, the unconquerable sun. So the combined festivals resulted in an extended winter holiday season. Business was postponed and even slaves feasted. There was drinking, gambling, and singing, and nudity was relatively common. It was the best of days, according to the poet Catullus. The Feast of Sol Invictus on December 25th was a sacred day in the religion of Mithraism, which was widespread in the Roman Empire. Its god Mithras was a solar deity of Persian origin, identified with the sun. It displayed its unconquerability as Sol Invictus when it began to rise higher in the sky following the winter solstice. Hence, December 25th was celebrated as the sun's birthday. In two, uh, 274, Emperor Aurelian officially designated December 25th as the Festival of Sol Invictus. Evidence that early Christians were observing December 25th as Jesus' birthday comes from Sextus Julius Africanus' book, Chronologia, uh, Chronographia, an early reference book for Christians, yet from the first identification of Christ's birth with a pagan holiday was obviously controversial. Why wouldn't it be? You know, today in China, they celebrate for two days the birth of Buddha. How would you feel if China said, hey, from now on, that's the birth of Jesus? And everybody knows that's the birth of Buddha, and everything goes along with that. So if you were a Christian at this time, and you're like, wait, this is all this pagan worship to 
it's idolatry. Now we're going to make it Christian and Christianize it. How would you feel about that? Would you say there's something not right about this? Because I think that's the real question that it came for the people that were living at this time. So the theologian Oregon, writing in 245 AD, he denounced the idea of celebrating the birth of Jesus as if he were a king pharaoh. Thus, Christmas was celebrated with a mixture of Christian and secular customs from the beginning and remains so to this day. This, again, according to New World Encyclopedia. So the first mention of December 25th as the birth date of Jesus occurs in AD 336. So this is 300 years after the time of Jesus. This was not something new, and it came specifically from a, a day that was already being celebrated. So one of the things that was very interesting, you could read this about Catholic history wherever they went. Wherever they would go, they would look at the practices of the people. And what do you not want to do? Don't mess, right? Don't mess with it. If we can get them to accept Jesus and keep their practices, we can do that. So All Hallows' Eve. And All Saints Day, if you, if you study that, what you find is the mixing of Catholicism going into places where there were feasts celebrated to other gods and idols, and basically they mix it together. And so the idea of where did St. Valentine's Day come from? Where did St. Patrick's Day come from? Where, where did Easter come from? Why would we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with bunny and colored eggs? Where, where does that come from? How does that happen? But if you can take what people enjoy and mix it, it makes it more palatable to transition them to what would be a new belief. But ultimately what happens is it becomes a mixture of truth and error. Now, when you mix truth and error, what do you get? Error. error. You, when you mix truth and error, you get error. So the problem with this is for the people that were living at this time in the fourth century now as we start to look at this, they're being told this is what the church is going to do, but they know where these days come from. And there's a lot of mixing going on. And so even the theologians at the time are like, what is, what's, what's up with this? How are we going to do this? So the celebration of this day, as it says here, as Jesus' birthday, was probably influenced by pagan festivals held at that time. The ancient Romans held year-end celebrations to honor, uh, honor Saturn, their harvest god in Mithra, the god of light. Now, as all part of these celebrations, the people prepared special foods, decorated their homes with greenery, and joined in singing and gift-giving. These customs gradually became part of the Christmas celebration, again, according to the World Book Encyclopedia. So if you say, well, why, why do we cut down a tree and bring it into our house? Why do we take our lights and put them outside and put greenery on the houses and greenery around what we're doing? Where's this whole idea of mistletoe from the ceiling where, you know, hey, if you're under there with, with somebody, you're supposed to kiss. Where did, where did these things come from? But they all came from practices, and they all got absorbed into this, again, making it more palatable. So let's read on here. So it says, Christmas, the festival commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ, is celebrated by a majority of Christians on December 25th on the Gregorian calendar. But early Christians did not celebrate his birth. In the 3rd century, the Roman Empire, which at the time had not adopted Christianity, celebrated the rebirth of the unconquerable son, Sol Invictus, on December 25th. This holiday not only marked the return of longer days after the winter solstice, but also followed the popular Roman festival called the Saturnalia, during which people feasted and exchanged gifts. It was also the birthday of the Indo-European deity Mithra, the god of light and loyalty, whose cult was at the time growing popular among Roman soldiers. This again, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica on the origin of Christmas in December. So it is pretty interesting to think about that it was in December when you worship the sun, the sun kind of came to its shortest period of time, and now it's going to begin a rebirth by which every day the sun is going to grow longer, Right? So you go from about eight hours a day, depending on where you are on the planet, and it's going to grow to be a much bigger portion of your day. And so they were celebrating the worship of the sun, and ultimately that ended up being the date picked to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. So what was the initial reaction then to Christians wanting to turn again and celebrate feasts that served other gods? Was that a good thing? Notice what it says here. So... In teaching the people 
It said that uh, Tertullian had to assert that Saul was not the Christian's God, Jesus, and Augustine denounced the heretical identification of Christ with Saul in the Catholic Encyclopedia because when it first started to transition, what people were thinking was the Son, the shining Son, is Jesus the Son of God. And so ultimately they're having to try to explain how not to mix this because what people were doing is celebrating the Son and there was the mixing right away where they're like, wait a minute, Jesus isn't actually the sun in the sky. But we know that's what you were worshiping as the birth of the sun in the sky, but now we want you to worship the Son of God. And so that's kind of the, the things they had to deal with. So the church fathers here in the second and third century, such as Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, and Epiphanius, contended that Christmas was a copy of a pagan celebration, according to the Encyclopedia uh, Britannica. So by us Christians, the Saturnalia, the Feast of January, the Brumalia, and the Matronalia are now frequented. Gifts are carried to and fro. New Year's Day presents are made with din, and banquets are celebrated with uproar. Oh, how much more faithful are the heathen to their religion who take special care to adopt no solemnity from Christians. This according to Tertullian in De Idolatria. So do we kind of see that today? You know, I was just looking last night. Do you know what holiday sales are expected to be in the United States this year? It's $720 billion. Do you know how many households there are in the United States? About 125 million. That works out to be the average holiday sales per household, $5,700. The average person plans to spend, uh, average adult will spend over $1,000 in gifts, just the gifts, not including anything else that are done for holidays at this time of year. The partying, the revelry, what goes on with it is very clear. And so it's interesting how this is being noted back in Tertullian. He's starting to see what's going on, and he's like, the heathen, are, they're much more faithful to their celebrations in what they're wanting to do with this holiday than really what Christians would want to do. And I would just ask you, is it really any different today in how much consumerism there is, even in the United States of America, where we were to be founded on some Christian ideal principles, uh, Judeo principles? So let's notice this. As early as AD 245, the church father, Oregon, was proclaiming it heathenish to celebrate Christ's birthday as if he were merely a temporal ruler when his spiritual nature should be the main concern. This view was echoed throughout the centuries, but found strong, widespread advocacy only with the rise of Protestantism. So that happens much later. Notice here, to these serious-minded, sober clerics, the celebration of Christmas flew in the face of all they believed, drunken revelry on Christmas. The day was not even known to be Christ's birthday. It was merely an excuse to continue the customs of pagan Saturnalia, uh, this according to the Christian Almanac uh, from 1979. So Christians of Armenia and Syria accused the Christians of Rome of sun worship for celebrating Christmas on December 25th. But why wouldn't they? That is the exact practices they were engaging in. All they did was exchange from Sol Invictus to Christ Mass. That was the difference. That was the change. So Pope Leo the Great in the 5th century tried to remove certain practices at Christmas, which he considered in no way different from sun worship. So this according to Celebrations, the complete book of American Holidays by Robert Myers from 1972. I want you to notice this verse from Galatians. Sometimes this verse gets used, at least verse 11 here, saying you should stop observing God's feast days. But I want you to notice the whole context of what Paul was writing here to the Galatians. He said, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. So he's not talking about the true God. He's talking about those things that are not gods. But now after you've known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desired again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. The reality is the Christian church as a whole has put aside, just factually, celebrating the holy days and the holidays that are in the Bible and have adopted holidays as their own that you can't find in Scripture at all. So therein lies the question, where do we stand on these things? 
The Romans kept the winter solstice with the feast of drunkenness and riot. The Christians thought that they could bring a better meaning into that feast. They tried to persuade their flocks not to drink or eat too much and to keep the feast more austerely, but without success. This according to a history of Christianity by Owen Chadwick from 1995. So how did Christmas then progress through the centuries among Christians? So notice this with me. As the church in Rome only formally celebrated December 25th and 336 during the reign of the Emperor Constantine, who made Christianity the effective religion of the empire, some have speculated that choosing this date had the political motive of weakening the established pagan celebrations. The date was not widely accepted in the Eastern Empire where January 6 had been favored for another half century and Christmas did not become a major Christian festival until the 9th century, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica. So still, like in the Greek Orthodox Church today, January 6 is the date that they would hold to uh, for Christmas. Now notice this, in early years of Christianity, the birth of Jesus was not celebrated. In the 4th century, church officials decided to institute the birth of Jesus as a holiday. Unfortunately, the Bible does not mention a date for his birth, a fact Puritans later pointed out in order to deny the legitimacy of the celebration. Although some evidence suggests that his birth may have occurred in the spring, why would shepherds be herding in the middle of winter? So Pope Julius I chose December 25th, and it is commonly believed that the church chose this date in an effort to adopt and absorb the traditions of the pagan Saturnalia festival, first called the Feast of the Nativity. The custom spread to Egypt by 432 and to England by the end of the 6th century. So again, when you think about those in England, where, where did, when did they start celebrating Christmas? It wasn't until the end of the 6th century. By the end of the 8th century, the celebration of Christmas had spread all the way to Scandinavia. This is according to uh, the History Channel uh, and the program that they did on Christmas. So by the 5th century, it, the Roman church was ordering that the birth of Christ be observed on this date, December 25th, even though this was the day of the old Roman feast of the birth of soul, one of the names of the sun god. So Encyclopedia Americana. So I'm giving you a lot of the information that overlays but I want you to notice this isn't just from one source, and this isn't just my, this is not my ideas. I'm trying to present information so that you can see there's, this is widespread teaching and widely understood. So then it says here, in the late 300s, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. The popularity of Christmas grew until the Reformation, a religious movement of the 1500s. Why would it grow in popularity until that time. This movement gave birth to Protestantism. During the Reformation, many Christians began to consider Christmas a pagan celebration because it included non-religious customs. During the 1600s, because of these feelings, Christmas was outlawed in England. Did you know that? And in parts of the English colonies in America. Did you know it literally was against the law in places in the United States to celebrate Christmas? because they were looking at it from a biblical worldview, saying, this is idolatrous, and we want our community to be God-based with a biblical worldview. Would you ever think that today? You didn't know the facts on it? This is from the World Book Encyclopedia. It's a really amazing thing, the way transitions can happen in our minds and in our society, and how quickly mindsets can change. Now, we see this more today than ever, but this conversation that we're having today has been something that has happened throughout Christian history and just understanding what it is and why it is and where uh, Christians took it. So notice here, the suppression of the mass during the Reformation led to a sharp change in the observance of Christmas in some countries. In England, the Puritans condemned the celebration and from 1642 to 1652 issued a series of ordinances forbidding all church services and festivities. This feeling was carried over to America by the pilgrims, and it was not until the 19th century wave of Irish and German immigration that enthusiasm for the feast began to spread throughout the country. Objections were swept aside, and the old traditions revived among Protestants as well as Catholics, this according to Collier's Encyclopedia. So remember how at the beginning of this message, as we started to look, we said, how many, how many places in the Bible was this talked about? The answer you gave was zero. Correct answer. So think of this. 
you are basically without the word of God. You're, you're believing what the, the priests are telling you from the Catholic Church, essentially, as it's going throughout Europe. And people start to say, what if we could share the word? People like Martin Luther started making copies of the scriptures. And people like William Tyndale and John Wycliffe, and people got engaged in the Bible. And guess what they found? That the things they were being taught as part of the religious practices of Christianity were nowhere to be found in the scriptures. So their heart was, we need to get back to the Bible. We need to purify it. And you may recall that these men, not, uh, not Martin Luther, uh, but William Tyndale and Wycliffe and others who wanted to spread the word of God, they were killed for it. They were killed to prevent the word of God. But their desire was, and I love the way, uh, I can't remember now if it was Tyndale or Wycliffe that said, their desire was that every common farmer would be able to have a knowledge of the scripture just as much as the Pope himself. Because they wanted people to read the Bible. What was, why was it called Protestant? It was protesting the Catholic Church's teaching of Christianity that was not in line with the scriptures. And ultimately, you and I have the scriptures today. It was because men and women were willing to lay down their lives and give up their reputations for us to have the Bible. Now the Bible is commonplace. How well are we reading what it says? And how much is it a part of dictating our practices, our traditions, and the beliefs that we have? So the basic objection to this got set aside. But I think another thing for us to consider is sometimes we think that practices that are part of Christianity have just always been there. Can we see now from the 19 sources of different encyclopedias and books that have been written on this subject this was not something that Jesus and his disciples celebrated. It was not something their disciples or their disciples or their disciples celebrated. It wasn't something that became common for 300 years after the time of Jesus. And then as it grew and grew, as soon as the Bible became available, those who were reading the scripture said, we got to stop doing this, and went so far as even to make it illegal in England and in parts of America because they wanted to get it out of what their practices were because they wanted to say, let's do it the way God wants us to do it. So notice here, in England, Protestants found their own quieter ways of celebrating in calm and meditation, while the strict Puritans refused to celebrate at all. The pilgrims in Massachusetts made a point of working on Christmas as if it was any other day. So Cal, your people, they were working. On June 3rd, 1647, Parliament established punishments for observing Christmas and certain other holidays, and this policy was reaffirmed in 1652, this according to the Christmas Almanac. So it hasn't had the cheery history that we might think it has today and how it's been incorporated into Christian observance. Even colonial America considered Christmas more of a raucous revelry than a religious occasion. So tarnished, in fact, was its reputation in colonial America that celebrating Christmas was banned in Puritan New England, where the noted minister Cotton Mather described Yuletide merrymaking as an affront to the grace of God. This to be found in uh, U.S. News and World Report, the article that they did on Christmas back in December of 1996. In New England, Christmas remained outlawed until the mid 19th century. That's not really that long ago. Until the mid-19th century, and in Boston, classes were held in the public schools on Christmas Day until 1870. So again, if we think that Christians who were coming here to America were all into celebrating Christmas, that really wasn't the case. It wasn't until, again, the German and Irish Catholic invasion of the United States happened that this became common practice and it became something that was supported. So again, they were holding classes until 1870 with pupils who missed school that day being punished or dismissed. The mass immigration of Irish Catholics uh, to New England brought about the restitution of Christmas celebrations. This according to the Religious Holidays and Calendars Encyclopedic Handbook from 1993. So we remember that the Christmas festival is a gradual evolution from times that long antedated the Christian period. It was overlaid upon heathen festivals, and many of its observances are only adaptations of pagan 
to Christian ceremony, the story of Santa Claus uh, written by William Wash. So here's the question then that I want us to think about. Is it okay in God's eyes to mix the practice of false religion and to use them in the worship of the one true God? Is it okay in God's eyes? Because ultimately that is the question we should be asking ourselves as Christians. You see, it's one thing when there's a holiday that is not associated with, with Christ, but I want us just to think about, in God's eyes, here's his son, and, and he actually has holidays that all celebrate his son. All of them. All of them celebrate his son. He created it. He talks about it in the Old Testament. He confirms it in the practice and observance and example in the New Testament. And the Christian church has set these aside for celebration of something that has nothing to do with God's mind on it. Now, I want us to, to ask the question, how do we continually go about in our own lives looking for purity? Because beyond what we're talking about today, this is just something that's very obvious and seen in terms of practices and how they can creep in. But what about the practices in our own lives? What about the idolatries or the practices that come from the world that we incorporate into our own Christian walk? See, because we might be somebody that says, oh yeah, David, I haven't celebrated Christmas like you for a long time. But does the challenge ever really stop of trying to understand how much of what we accept as belief, practice, exercise, tradition in our life come from things that are really just leading us astray, that are not true. Now, we're always going to be in this world until the resurrection or, or the return of Jesus Christ. We are in the world, and, and Jesus said, I don't pray that you take them from the world, but that you keep them in the world. But how do we walk as lights in the world, as ambassadors of a kingdom that does things different than what is common in the world? So I want us to look here at some verses and just kind of see, can it mix? Does God view it as mixed? If you put God's name on a practice, does it become holy? So look at, with me in Exodus 32, verses 1 to 8. It says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in your ears, in the ears of your wives, excuse me, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears. And they brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt." So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Now, where do you think they learned? Why do you think Aaron would say such a thing? Bring me all your gold. Get your earrings out. Bring me gold. I'm going to melt it, and I'm going to make a calf. Do you, do you think this was an original idea? Or did, he, did he see this done somewhere before? See, they were living in Egypt, where there was all kinds of worship of gods and idols. And so... They start to prepare a practice, and even what Aaron is doing, Aaron, who would be the high priest of, of God on the earth, the first high priest, here he is actually doing things the way he had seen it happening before. But here's what I want us to notice. So when Aaron saw it, it said he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is the feast to Yahweh. He didn't put another god on there. He didn't say it's to Baal or to Mithra or to Ishtar. He said it's to Yahweh. Did his putting the name of God on what was happening make it holy? How did God view it? So it says they rose early on the next day. They offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said... Go get down your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. So putting his name on it, he didn't say, okay, because you put my name on it, I embrace it. 
He said, no, they've corrupted themselves. And they turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. So the practice of putting God's name on it didn't make it holy. It was taking his name in vain and putting it on a practice that was corrupt, that it was idolatrous. Jeremiah 10, it says this, Hear the word of the Lord. This is verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. One cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it out with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They make it upright like a palm tree. But speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid for them, for they can do no evil. Neither also is in them to do good. So God saying, don't learn the practices that other nations do in the way they serve their gods or making gods out of things that cannot be. Notice with me in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26 to 33. Scott gave an excellent sermon on this not that long ago. It said, and Jeroboam said in his heart, and this was when Jeroboam and Rehoboam, again, check out that sermon, but when God uh, was, uh, after the death of Solomon, excuse me, when uh, Jeroboam uh, determined to have his own kingdom against Rehoboam, because he didn't consider his brother righteous, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah split. And the first thing that the kingdom of Israel did was make itself not like Judah. And they said, uh, so Jeroboam said in his heart, the kingdom may return to the house of David. So if these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of the people will turn back to the Lord. Did you hear that? If people would go and keep God's feasts, he was concerned that their hearts would turn back to God. We actually have example of this in the life of Josiah and in the life of Hezekiah. That when they became kings, they turned the people back. They not only stripped away all the idolatry, but they got the people to turn back to God. And why? How? They started celebrating the feasts. When Nehemiah was brought back, remember after all the people went into captivity, after all the kings... And, and Nehemiah and Ezra come back to build again Jerusalem, what did they start doing? They started keeping the feasts. And when God sent his own son into the world, on what day was it that he was taken and killed and offered as a sacrifice? On what day was it he was resurrected? On what day did he send the Holy Spirit? Do we find it not amazing that God has been teaching a people to remember him and turn back to him through the keeping of holidays that he has commanded that we would celebrate on Passover, Christ our Passover, that we would celebrate on the day of first fruits, Christ the first fruits raised from the dead, and that we would celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit and the church being formed on the day of Pentecost, on the very feast that God commanded to be celebrated for thousands of years before it actually happened at the time of Christ. And that is still celebrated after the time of Christ by his disciples. See, we sometimes can think, what's the big deal? What's the big deal with any of it? But when we come to the truth, do you know what happens when you look at and study the word of God and the truth of it? God actually brings you through the words to him and now we get to understand his mind, his heart, his desire on things. You see, when we were reading in Exodus 32, the, when Aaron was taking the golden calf and saying, tomorrow's the feast to Yahweh, and Yahweh is saying, no, it isn't. We got to hear his voice. We got to hear what God thinks of it. And the reality is, if we are not hearing what God thinks of things, then we got to get back to what Christianity is because ultimately, unless we desire 
to take up our cross daily and follow him, we're not worthy to come after him. Are we looking to go about the way of God according to the way that God says? See, what I'm really calling out to you today, it's not about Christmas. What I'm really asking you is, is God's voice first and foremost in your life and in my life for the way we do things? Before God ever gave us this physical building, when we were meeting over at Bread of Life, I was praying and studying through the kings uh, and, and through the kings of uh, Judah and looking at why it was that kings who were going along were rejecting God, but then what were they doing when God called them back? When he said, this one at eight years old turned to God. This one did what was right in the sight of the Lord. This one did what was right, just like his father David. This one did just like David did. There wasn't even a king that was doing his right. Do you know what they all did? What they all really had in common? They came in and said, guys, we have so much idolatry going on here. It's all got to stop. All of it. We're bringing it in, and we're mixing the truth and error, and we have all this mixing going on, and they basically said, you got to tear it down. Tear down the high places. Tear down those altars. Get rid of the names of those false gods. Get rid of it. Do you, do you see that there was a power that God had? And then as he led them on, then you see Josiah, Hezekiah saying, let's get back and keep God's feast. Not only did they get rid of the idolatrous stuff, they said, let's start looking back at the truth. Now, my encouragement to all of us is this, that we learn from this one example how to do it. How precious is something to you that God would say, that's corrupt. That's not what I said to do. It's a mix. Will we honor God in his house? And his house is in us. And when God was leading us to, to purchase this facility, it was the one thing he put on my heart. Don't bring the worship of other gods into this place. Keep it pure. And I hope that we always keep it pure and it always will be a place of healing. But again, I'm not just talking about this holiday. I'm not talking about holidays. I'm talking about what is going on in the worship in our hearts of Almighty God. Are we willing to strip away the things that we like, that we find pleasure in, that we find warmth in, that we find emotional coddling and comfort in? For God, and rather to take comfort in the things that God already says, this is what I comfort you. This is how I do it. To strip away our lives and allow Jesus to be the Lord to bring us back to the truth. Because here's the thing, when we study in the word of God, his ways, I don't think God just was making it up on a whim. I think it was very thoughtful, that it was deliberate of what he wanted us to do and why. And in the study of his deliberate instructions, we find a heart that focuses on him and on the truth that we find in him that brings us to a right place with him where we say, God, I'm not gonna make you in my image or make you to be who I want you to be. I'm gonna be the person that says, I want to see you as you are. So long have we as a Christian church for centuries been creating God in our image and making engraven images of our God rather than listening to what he says. And ultimately what was so cool about the Protestant Reformation was they said, let's get back to God and what he actually said. And what we want to encourage here at this church is to say, let's just get back to God and what he said. Why do we have to make it up? Why do we have to make part of our Christianity and our walk what is not found in his word? Let's not add to it, and let's not take away from it. So as Jeroboam said uh, in his heart, so, okay, so he said, there, unless they go up and offer sacrifices, uh, this is 1 Kings 12, verses uh, 27, the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. So he changed the timing of it. Like the feast that was in Judah, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. 
How happy was God with that? That kingdom was designed right away with a worship system that was a counterfeit of the true. How many kings of Israel were there that were righteous? Zero. Do we think that what he was plotting in his heart was, if they start worshiping God in truth, they're going to go back to him, they're going to leave me. Therefore, let me create something that mimics the truth, with our own feasts that are kind of like the ones that are true, but they're not. They'll be our own. And that way we can solidify a worship that is counterfeit. And when worship is counterfeit, the fruit was there wasn't one righteous king from all of that. Notice what it says here in the law in Deuteronomy 12, 28 to 32. It says, Observe and obey all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever. When you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. And when the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. See, God already told us who he is. He already told us how to worship him. What we should be doing is saying, how can we do this in spirit and in truth? And so he's saying that the common thing of man, why would he give the warning? Because he knows people look and say, oh, that looks like a lot of fun. That looks like a good practice. That looks like it's really good and reverent to do. What does God say? You shall not do that. Do not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. So for me personally as a pastor, to encourage you to have a Christian practice that isn't of Christ or in his word, Do you see how wrong I would be to do that? Where would my good conscience be before God to encourage a practice unto Christ that is actually not a practice unto Christ? It's a practice that came from other sources. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Can we mix it together? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So, did a lot of reading today. But the reason we did a lot of reading is I wanted you to see just what it says about these things. We didn't go into all the practices. If you are interested, obviously you can do that on your own. There's lots of information to be read about these things. But I hope that what we can take away is something that God would want our hearts to have, and that is this. My encouragement in my own heart and to each of you is to purify yourself before the Lord, to constantly look to find the purity that's in him. And when we see things that aren't right in our lives, that look wrong, our thinking, if we look fleshly, if we are full of greed, if we're living life with dissipation, that we would look as to why that is. I mean, time is precious, you know, last week, Scott was talking about the preciousness of life, just being reminded of it through his, his, his personal trial. And, and the thing is that every day is a day we get to make a choice for God or for ourselves, for what he wants or what the world wants. And, you know, it's said that the opposite of, of courage isn't always cowardice. Sometimes it's just simply conformity. You go along because it's easier to go along. 
my goal as a pastor would be to ask you to challenge yourself. What am I doing in my life? Am I just doing what seems common because this is the way we do it? Or are we looking to break out for the Lord and allow God to create in us a clean heart and clean practices and things that bring us back continually to him? The truth will always point us to Christ. And who we are in him should be a main focus of what we do. And so let's make it our determined effort that in all things we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that he will take care of everything else and knowing that he is the one that will set our hearts straight, that he will make us clean and white, that it's through him that we will have the life that he desires for us to have. So that's why we don't do it. Because you can't find it in the word. It's not a pointing to truth. And when we study where it really is, we find that the origins were not of God at all, but of the worship of something other than God. And so we don't make it part of our practice. But in our lives, let us be doing the same thing. Let us think about this, but let us really think about where we are before the Lord today. And let's seek his help. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, we know there are so many things probably in our mind, in our hearts, that are not lined up with you and where we need to be. And God, we can look at an example today of just how there can be a mixing. And I ask that you would just help us to see where in our lives we have a mixing of truth and error in the way that we worship you and serve you. Please forgive us our iniquities and our sins. Please cleanse us from our unrighteousness and help us to walk in a way that's true. And please, God, in the very place where our thinking is not right, I pray that you not only show us that it's not, but that you would please lead us into your perfect paths. And that, God, we would have the grace, the mercy, the love, and frankly, the power that we can minister to others in the name of your Son. Forgive us, God, for any ways that in which we are driven by our own resources and by our own pleasures. And let us be driven for your will and your way. For Jesus set the example and we seek to follow. Let us teach the things that he taught and what he taught us to observe. Let us also teach others to observe. And let us be faithful to him who is, was so faithful to you and so faithful to us in giving himself for us. Let his life always be at the center of our thinking. In our hearts and minds, let us receive Jesus afresh here today. Let Jesus be the king. Let his rulership be in us. And as ambassadors for him, Holy Father, cause us to always be sharing the ways of the kingdom of God with those we come into contact with. Let us share their ways, his ways with others, that they may know and that they may see that truly Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is coming soon to this earth. We pray that that time would come quickly. We thank you, Father, for all things in his name. Amen.